Dr. Wani, it's really a pleasure to have you back at the at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies as a former dean of the Africa Center who was involved in uh, the center's activities from, from inception. You talked about uh, uh, human rights uh, policy alignment uh, in the context of the security sector. Yeah. The key question uh, uh, on our minds is, um, is there a trade-off between human rights and security? Mm -hmm. Because this is a discussion that, um, uh, that has been had on the African continent and elsewhere. Uh, is it false? Uh, is there a choice between one or the other? Uh, what is your opinion? No, I, I, I mean, you're absolutely right. This is an issue that comes up a lot. Uh, people often argue uh, it is either human rights or security and so on. Uh, the simple answer, in my view, is yes, it is a false, it's a false debate. It's, uh, uh, it, it is the result, I think, of a, a serious set of misconceptions, misunderstandings, about about human rights in particular, but also I must say from the human rights community uh, as well. Uh, I, I think if you if you look at it uh, analytically, the objective of human rights and the objectives of security are not dissimilar. Human rights is about human dignity. It's about bundle of rights that individuals, uh, citizens of a country, do have whether it is an issue of your freedom, the right to be free from torture, or the freedom to move, uh, or uh, of course the sanctity of life and what have you. Security is not very different from that. Security is there to enable a society to enjoy those things. Huh? So in some ways they are complementary. In other ways they, 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 they sort of, uh, they, 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 they target the same sorts of uh, uh, goals. Now. I, I say it is a question of misconception because I think oftentimes people caricature human rights. They reduce it to some simple, very simplistic ideas and that then generates negativity. I think there are also uh, times when the people who want to do security are thinking about methods and approaches that uh, uh, may not be consistent with even the, the, the rule of law. And so when human rights people come in and say, look, you can't do this, you can't do the other, this is un un unacceptable, uh, you can't hold an individual in jail for more than this because the Constitution says so, the immediate reaction is uh, you are undermining security. Uh, but I do think that, in fact, uh, there is a way to, do, to, to, to attain both. Yeah. Now, um, so you say that uh, it's, uh, these are very, very complementary um, uh, ideas. Human rights as well as, as well as security is very complementary. So given that, um, what should uh, rising uh, security sector professionals uh, from the African continent, what should they know um, about this, about this complementarity and how should they approach it? Uh, well, I, I think it, 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 it goes to maybe a number of very general points that uh, I'll, I'll touch on very briefly. One, I think it is uh, a proper, first of all, starting off in sort of the professional education and what have you, of understanding uh, the, the, the proper objectives of security. What, what is the secu secu security sector intended to do? How are we going to do it? What is the purpose and objective of human rights? I, if you look at it historically, I think part of the problem here arises because uh, the, the human rights community and the security community were at times seen as being in contention with each other. Uh, we, were, we were fighting each other. And this, this is a result of historical happenstances during a military regime, for example, when there were excesses by a regime and the human rights people were the ones fighting it. So human rights took on a very political uh, sort of undertone. By the same token, the human rights community also was somewhat mistrustful, became actually not somewhat, became seriously suspicious and mistrustful of the human rights community. And, and that I think created that gap. So the first thing is to, to, for the security people, first of all, to have a better understanding of the, the, under, the dimensions and, and, and perspectives and goals of security. And of course also for the human rights community to, 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 to have the same. Secondly, uh, I think we need to look at where this tension arises a lot. It is usually at the operational level. Uh, uh, how you how you you handle 
communities, the rules of engagement. I think we, we have had a, f a few examples where we have dealt with this case. In Uganda, for example, uh, there was a period when uh, uh, the UPDF uh, was facing very serious allegations about the way that it was conducting a disarmament program in, in Karamoja. Uh, in the northeastern part of, uh, part, of, part of Uganda. A lot of accusations about torture, about this and the other. And uh, eventually the human rights community intervened and I think it's a very good illustration of just how this can be done. Uh, at the end, it, 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 once you take away some of this mistrust and suspicion, it became very clear that the goals, there was a serious problem in Karamoja. There were serious issues with small arms the effect of those arms in, in uh, small arms in uh, insecurity in the area uh, and, and indeed the issue of disarmament was not uh, a bad goal as such. The question was how do you do it mm -hmm. and can you do it consistent with, uh, with, uh, with, with, uh, with human rights. At the end of the day the UPDF actually set up a human rights desk uh, to try to deal with the issue. I think they, they undertook a very extensive education of the, uh, of the, of, of the military. I believe that uh, there was uh, a much better understanding of how to do the job. Uh, how, do, how do you go about collecting guns from people? Uh, how, you, how do you move from a voluntary process to uh, a, a forceful manner of doing so? And when you are doing that, how do you deal with uh, communities? How do you handle people in a home? Uh, do, 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 you know, getting away from practices such as bundling the, an entire family uh, together and perhaps shooting randomly at people and so on. So I, I think that from an operational standpoint, one can certainly come up with uh, uh, acceptable ways of uh, achieving the objectives of security consistent with the ideals of human rights. Right. right. Now, uh, today, uh, 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 you talked about um, uh, institutional gaps. Yeah. And uh, one of the things you said is that uh, uh, often you tend to have um, very good documents, very good strategy papers, you know, strategy papers on human rights, yes. for instance, you know, which security sector institutions might have. But underneath that, you really mm -hmm. don't have the capacity, you don't have implementation, that these institutions are not really organic and they're sort of out of place. Uh, I wonder if you could say a bit more about that. Yeah, well, I, I think the, 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 this is indeed, it has become the biggest question and challenge in development. Uh, the starting point is why uh, seemingly well-designed, reasonable, policies, very basic things, cannot be implemented. Some people even give the examples of running a post office. Eh? Everybody knows how that has to be done. Uh, the issue of delivering mail, some very basic protocols have been, have been uh, put in place to try to ensure that that is done. A comparison is made among different levels of societies and, and I think the very, very interesting results that uh, in, in societies with very strong capable institutions which tend to be also those where there is a fairly higher level of development and what have you. If a policy is adopted with respect to how mail is going to be delivered, you say, you know, when the wrong piece of mail ends up in your, in your, in your post office, what do you do with it? There's a three-day rule of returning it. By and large, they accomplish those. They will get them back. On the other extreme, when you go to countries with very uh, poor development indicators, those that have not done uh, very well. Uh, a post office could be set up. It looks like a post office in any other part of the world. It has mail people, there are post office boxes. You recall how it is in Uganda. You, you have a box number, you get in there. But uh, indications are those kinds of things never get implemented at all. And so the puzzle here is why? Why is it? that if you take that simple example of the post office, or maybe a healthcare facility. I, mean, I, I was reading in the, in the paper in Uganda uh, today, actually, about the Speaker of Parliament going back to her home area in Kamoli and getting livid. I think it was over the weekend because she had delivered some x-ray machines and things like that to the healthcare, or to the hospital or healthcare, uh, health facility at home. She goes back a year later those machines have not been set up. Uh, they are not functioning and people are being sent out 
uh, if you, 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 you are recommended for an X-ray of diagnosis, you have to go out to a, a private service provider, pay for the X-ray, and then bring it back to the health facility, and maybe you go through that. That's just one very, very simple uh, example. Uh, so there you have a case where the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the health facility is in place. There are presumably doctors and nurses there. They have gone through the trouble of bringing the X-ray equipment there, and I assume what is needed to operate the equipment should also be in place. But yet it is not put in place. This is, this is what, what we are referring to by the institutional dilemma. A lot of these pieces are put together. And, 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 and talking about institution, I think part of what I wasn't able to elaborate on in the discussion there is that it is a much more nuanced concept than just having a building, some staff members in a place, rules of procedure on the ground, but it's actually how they function in practice. Mm -hmm. huh? Do they understand their tasks? Do they actually do it? Are they sufficiently motivated uh, to do that? Do they account for results? And I think this is the fundamental point that is being made here, that uh, we do have the semblance of institutions, but they actually don't operate in the manner that they are supposed to in order to deliver the required results. Now, from that perspective, from that perspective, what should the relationship between international partners and local partners in terms of um, advancing mm -hmm. uh, human rights uh, in the context of uh, the security sector, bringing human rights and the security sector together, uh, but in the context of this, uh, uh, these institutional gaps, what should that relationship be? Uh, what should international actors do? How should they approach the problem? I, I think the, some very basic lessons we are learning. Uh, first of all, what I referred to there as sort of a, a cut and paste doesn't work. This notion of best practices, they are important, but we shouldn't take them as somehow suggesting that you should copy wholesale, go and integrate. I think that we, we, are, not, we, we are not there yet in terms of being able to, to, to deconstruct a practice. This is working well there. Why is it working well? What are the specific things that enable that to operate? Yeah? Context is certainly a part of it. There are a lot of other intangibles that are very critical and relevant here. Now, Part of the, the, the big problem and the mistakes that we, 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 we get into is going out there and copying a model, a model law or this and that that has worked well in country A and bringing it down to a country with a totally different uh, environment and putting it uh, in place. I think recognizing that is an extremely important thing, which then means obviously that you have to have a very good understanding of institutional dynamics. Why, why do certain institutions work better than the others? What are the different parts that make it possible? Uh, some people are also arguing that integrating it into context is extremely important. Because wh one thing we are learning also is that, uh, uh, you know, you, 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 you put one thing in one context, it behaves one way. You take it to a different context. The environment there has a tremendous amount of influence on how things, things work. Huh? I gave the example there of uh, going to, uh, maybe you, you, you want to go and get the title to your land. Uh, you arrive in that, uh, in that land office. All the things are in place to make it work. <laughs> there is a, a title registry. There are rules and processes about this. There is a way for you to prove that you are actually the owner of that land. There is perhaps a duplicate copy. There are provisions and, hold, and there are offices that are supposed to handle that. But... In one particular environment, you can walk in. I, I went to, to the Department of Motor Vehicles just, uh, last week in Virginia. It took me 30 minutes to register a car that I had just bought, a new one. And I was thinking, if I took this back to Uganda, huh, would I be able to come out in 30 minutes with the registration of that car? <laughs> Probably not. Actually, most likely, no. I will not be able to do that. Uh, and, and that raises a very interesting question. I don't think we should, we should dismiss it simply on account of... Uh, lack of capacity and this and that. I think we need to, to properly understand the dynamics that make that system respond differently to these rules in order for them to, to be able to work well. I think the point I'm driving at here is not just the context but also the issue of ownership. Yeah? Uh, and, and going back to specifically to your question, 
uh, those who come with wonderful propositions and proposals on the table have to factor in the context as well. And I think the adaptation of those things is something that can only be done uh, gradually. Uh, I also talked about leapfrogging. Frankly, uh, I'm, I'm coming to the, to the conclusion that perhaps in, in, in many ways uh, we have, uh, to our detriment, I must say, overlooked that element of the integrating processes and mechanisms in, in, a, in a rather deep way. Uh, you take the idea of human rights. It sounds fairly uh, simple. We have constitutions that have Bill of Rights. Uh, we have specific laws on issues of gender integration and non-discrimination. We have, uh, uh, in many, many countries, we have adopted, uh, incorporated the Convention Against Torture. There are laws against that. But yet the practice on the ground is totally different. Mm. Uh, it does happen across the continent with a great deal of uh, regularity, uh, which means that it is not enough to bring in those rules and processes. It is not enough to adopt a piece of legislation. One needs to be able to, uh, to, to, to sufficiently integrate it within the context of a country. And, and more importantly, it means also that you need to go beyond the, 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 the elite level. Some people are arguing now that in fact what happens to a large extent is that this is a conversation that is taking place with a very, very thin layer of society at the top. Yeah? So very critical operators, operatives, your local policeman, uh, the traffic person on the other hand, uh, simply doesn't understand. And they respond to a very different set of uh, stimuli. Yeah? <laughs> they, are not, they are not the same. And in, in that context, what is very well-meaning and looks very good doesn't really work. Yeah. Well, um, that's certainly, certainly uh, uh, a huge challenge uh, yeah. on the continent. And, uh, you know, we'll definitely uh, uh, like to continue uh, this discussion and uh, really want to thank you for, for your time. Thank I want you to thank you for your time. And uh, really we'll definitely... Uh, really appreciate that. I, I think we have some... Uh, it, it's, it is exciting. I mean, I, I think the, 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 the point that I find very intriguing uh, is we've been doing this business for how long now? I mean, people who talk about development say maybe 50, 60 years. And yet the conversation has moved much. And, and I think a very, very important adage, uh, I don't know whose song it was that when you, you keep keep trying, eventually you will succeed. That seems to be the, the motto. <laughs> but that may not be the way things work in the world. That maybe at some point you have to say, hey, I've tried this over and over and over. It is not working. Maybe it's time to step back and take a different look. But thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking thank you. to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.